Located in the South Atlantic Ocean, the island of St. Helena was remote, unpleasantly humid, and perpetually damp. Here, a man who had once conquered a continent and terrified the world was stuck in the deteriorating Longwood House, a far cry from the palaces he once resided in. He spent days reading, writing about the great heroes he admired, and sharing tales of his fascinating life with the throngs of visitors that made the journey to see him. Many afternoons were spent brooding about the 18th of June, 1815, the day that he, the first emperor of the French, was beaten one final time. is a word to be found only in the dictionary of fools. After doing the impossible and bloodlessly reassuming power, Napoleon was already back on the offensive. Having just won a strategic victory at Quatre Bras against the British, and what would be his final victory at Ligny against the Prussians, he was on the move toward the site that would reverberate in his mind forever, Waterloo. The reinvigorated Grand Armée that Napoleon mustered consisted of about 72,000 men, 14,000 of whom were cavalry. Unsurprisingly, given his fondness of artillery, Napoleon fielded an impressive 250 cannon, a full 60% more than the British. The coalition army under Arthur Wellesley, the first Duke of Wellington, consisted of 68,000 men, about 11,000 of which were cavalry, and 150 cannon. Finally, the Prussians under Gebhard von Blücher arrived later in the battle and had a total of 48,000 men, about 7,000 of whom were cavalry and approximately 134 cannon. On paper, Napoleon held a clear advantage. He had more men who were generally better trained and more experienced than their opponents and more firepower. Furthermore, as Wellington himself said while eating breakfast during the morning of the battle, Napoleon's presence on the battlefield was worth 40,000 men. But while Napoleon's troops were of higher quality, his officer corps left much to be desired. A serious brain drain among the higher ranks affected the French forces at Waterloo, and many officers were assigned command of unfamiliar units upon arrival to the battle. Even the best soldiers are ineffective when they lack direction. So, how did things shake out? Well, you guys know. Had it not been for the desertion of a traitor, I should have annihilated the enemy at the opening of the campaign. I should have destroyed him at Ligny if my left had done its duty. I should have destroyed him again at Waterloo if my right had not failed me. Before the battle began, the Duke of Wellington went to work fortifying the position where he would meet the French. Using the reverse slopes just outside the town of Waterloo, he was able to conceal many of his troops while fortifying three major defensible positions. These included the Chateau Hugomont to the west, and the Papillot farm to the east, which he intended to garrison as an anchor on either flank. In the center lay Le Hay Saint farmhouse and an adjacent sand pit. If all went as planned, Napoleon's flanks would be vulnerable no matter which position they attacked. Despite this geographic disadvantage, the Emperor of the French believed that victory was assured. However, the most dangerous threat to Napoleon was the proximity of the Prussian troops, who hoped to bolster Wellington's eastern flank. In order to delay their arrival, Napoleon dispatched Marshal Emmanuel du Grouchy with approximately 34,000 men, nearly a third of his total strength, to harass them, thereby buying himself enough time to face one enemy at a time. The decision was not a bad one, but a torrential rainstorm on the 17th delayed the French response. Napoleon consequently postponed the attack until midday on the 18th as to give the ground the time to dry perhaps miscalculating how long it would take the Prussians to arrive. 
When the battle properly began around noon, the French infantry began their faint attack on Hougoumont, an important communications hub. What should have been merely the opening stroke before an assault on the enemy center became a brutal slugfest as Napoleon sent wave after wave of men against the chateau. The British garrison held fast without drawing a significant number of reinforcements from the center. Furthermore, hiding behind the reverse slopes made Wellington's troops all but invulnerable to artillery fire. Though he had more men and perhaps could have overwhelmed the British eventually, time was not on Napoleon's side. Around 1 p.m., a mass of troops appeared in the distance. Finally, Grouchy was arriving. Oh wait, no, that's the Prussians. Napoleon's worst fear had now materialized. He would have to move fast or risk being overwhelmed. A dispatch was quickly sent to Grouchy, ordering him to return to the main army, but he never did for disputed reasons. His initial orders had been to pursue the Prussians and keep them at bay. Battling the Third Corps in the afternoon, the loyal general was following his emperor's orders to the letter. Well, not quite to the letter. He failed miserably to pin the Prussians down. It was his only job. He was too busy fighting a small contingent while the rest of Blucher's forces bore down on the increasingly beleaguered French army. Their arrival to the battlefield was slow, however, and Napoleon, with his unwavering sense of optimism, still believed he could win the day. His optimism wasn't entirely ill-founded. After two brigades of British heavy cavalry, among them the infamously cavalier Scots Greys, attacked the French, they were then caught in a counterattack by the French cuirassiers and lancers. The Scots Greys were essentially destroyed as a result, along with many of the other regiments in the two British brigades. To hinder the Prussian advance, Napoleon set up a cavalry screen supported by a corps of infantry. He then shifted his attention from Hugemont to the Allied center at La Haye Saint. Two brigades of infantry under the audacious Marshal Michel Ney attacked the farmhouse, but were repeatedly repulsed. When he mistakenly believed that he saw a break in the British line, Ney ordered a massive cavalry charge. Three divisions of French cavalry smashed into the enemy front as a result of Ney's carelessness, straight into anti-cavalry square formations. By 6 p.m., these mounted units had been completely depleted. But a 6,000-man infantry advance managed to secure the position after heavy fighting. From their hard-fought position, French artillery chewed through the Allied center, devastating Wellington's command post, and for a moment, it seemed that victory was within Napoleon's grasp, so long as Ney could get some reinforcements from the Imperial Guard held in reserve but Napoleon refused to give up the forces he was using to secure his flank against the Prussians, who had been advancing, while Ney launched one more wasteful cavalry attack after the next. With more Prussians arriving, and the French flank finally collapsing, utterly demoralized after the young guard had been beaten back, the Emperor was forced to deploy his old guard, a card that should have been played much earlier. By then, even the Old Guard, consisting of France's finest troops, seasoned veterans of numerous campaigns, could not turn the tide. They would rather die than surrender. By 9 p.m., it was all over. Four days later, Napoleon abdicated the imperial throne. The Hundred Days were at an end. In 1815, I relinquished the anticipation of ultimate success. I lost my first confidence. Perhaps I found that I was wearing beyond the time of life and which fortune usually proves favorable. Or, perhaps, the spell that had hung over my miraculous career was broken. Now that we've summarized the course of this historic battle, it's time to return to our original question. Was its outcome avoidable? First, let me step out of my armchair historian role and get ready for some armchair generalship. Much better. There's a handful of moments in the battle that are easy to point to as potentially fatal mistakes. 
Ney and Grushi are often targets for blame and have gotten their share of it over the years. Grushi was undeniably outplayed by the Prussians, and if he had more effectively delayed them or had been able to respond more rapidly to the order recalling him to the battlefield of Waterloo, events may have transpired differently. As for Ney, his numerous attacks on the British line were unnecessarily costly. He threw repeated cavalry charges against the British infantry while they were in square formation. Although the French displayed true heroism during these charges, they may as well have been falling on their own swords. An earlier combined arms attack that employed artillery and cavalry more effectively may have gone a long way. The possible permutations here, especially if we take earlier battles in the campaign into account, are nearly endless, and there's plenty of blame to go around. Historian Adam Zamoyski, in his biography Napoleon, A Life, suggests that Le Petit Caporal might have just lost his touch. He says, The younger Napoleon would have tied Wellington down head-on and outflanked him, pinning him in a trap of his own making. The Napoleon of old probably also would have been willing to dispatch the old guard to help secure Ney's position on La Haye Saint, and he might have not devoted so much manpower to attacking Hugemont, which, although an important position, was not worth the price paid. Napoleon has also been criticized for needlessly waiting for the ground to dry before attacking the British, but the trade-off would of course be delayed movement of mounted and artillery units. These strategic blunders were compounded on a tactical level by the decision to organize many of the men into closed columns, which, despite demoralizing the enemy, did not constitute the most effective option for maximizing firepower. All told, Bonaparte gave two reasons for his failure. Grouchy failing in checking the Prussians, and his great charge of cavalry being made half an hour too soon.